All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here with Steve Saxon of Bravero Cellars in Amity. It's July 7th, 2021. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, first and biggest question to get you started is why wine? My wife and I were, have always been big red wine fans. We met in 2005 and we were both um, avid red wine uh, drinkers. We, our first date was actually at a winery in California. Our second date was at a different winery in California. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we just did a lot of wine tasting together, both thoroughly enjoyed it. And then in uh, 2006, we met, we met this couple at a wine show in, uh, in Lodi, a spring wine show. Uh, liked them, liked their wines, and they invited us over to their, to their winery. So we went over and met with them, and uh, it was our first time really behind the scenes. They just gave us the whole behind the scenes, how we make wine, how we do our business. And we were... Uh, intrigued enough that we went back like the next weekend to hang out with them a little longer. The, over the course of the next three years, we helped them do everything. They grew Cabernet, but made a lot of different wines. And we helped them make wine um, throughout the year, mm -hmm. uh, from, from the picking of the grapes to the, to the bottling at the end. And we just took a, a real interest in, uh, in the business side of it. I'd spent 33 years in the corporate world and was, was starting to tire of, of that grind. Uh, so while I was getting tired of that, at the same time, my passion in red wine was growing. Mm -hmm. And it was a 10-year process. There was no uh, flip of a switch like, hey, let's get into business. It was a, a long, um, thorough 10-year process before we started our own winery. Got lots of questions about that. We'll back up for a second. Sure. Tell me about uh, your upbringing. Where, where, did you, where were you born? Where did you grow up? And what did you do after high school? Born in Albany, Oregon. Um, born and raised there. Spent my first 20-some years there. Graduated from Oregon State, went the big uh, 13 miles away to college. <laughs> <laughs> the, long, the long drive, I had to move away to go to college. Uh, but graduated from Oregon State with a degree in business. And, and was always determined to combine my, my business degree with my l love for fitness and sports. And so th I uh, spent 33 years in the health club industry, uh, in, mostly in California and loved it, the, 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 the purpose was always to have people come into your business in a good mood and leave in a better mood, uh, which is pretty much what we do now also. So I've spent my entire adult life in the happiness business. People uh, still come here in a good mood and they leave in a better mood. What point did wine become part of, uh, enjoying wine become part of your life? At what point in, the, in, your, in your career did that become something you started to drink and enjoy? Um, probably while I was working in the corporate world and whatever we would have, uh, have business dinners, I was always the guy assigned to, Steve, you're choosing the wine. Uh, so I, I just always enjoyed uh, big red wines, but I think being in, in the California area, in the Bay Area, uh, I gra just gravitated to big red wines because that's what was there. It's, it's everywhere, and Lodi is the Zinfandel capital of the world, and Zinfandel, Petit Syrah, Tempranillo from, from the Lodi region are all big in sugars, which produces a big alcohol, 15% alcohol wine, which we like. Mm -hmm. um, but I just like the, the boldness of a big, full-bodied, high tannin red wine. You mentioned the the process. So tell me about that process from the from kind of discovering the behind the scenes of a winery to starting a winery. Tell me about that process. Sure. What were the, what were the big steps along the way? So in 2006 it was the first harvest that we helped uh, helped Dart Wines, and for the next three years um, we helped them do everything. In 2009 we said, we'd like to make a barrel of wine. We want to start by making our first barrel, and my wife and I don't have children, and the photo of us with our first half ton of Tempranillo is like two very proud parents standing with their, <laughs> their first child. And we were, we were almost giddy, but, but he told us, you're gonna make the wine, I'm not gonna make it for you. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna learn how to make wine, you're, you're gonna learn hands on. So we, we sourced our own barrel, we sourced our own wine, we decided to make a Tempranillo and we made one barrel of Tempranillo. And it wasn't great, but it was, it was good enough. And uh, good enough that we decided we wanted to do, try this again. Mm -hmm. So the next year we made three barrels of two different varietals, a Petit Syrah and a Tempranillo. And the next year we made five barrels. Um, now we're accumulating a bunch of wine because we weren't selling any wine. Mm -hmm. We made it under our, our last name. My last name is Saxton. My wife is Serato. And our label is Saxton Serato. And each year, so for the next several years, we were making more and more wine and, and building up quite a, quite a collection of our own wine that we would, we would gift and, uh, and share. And people w were telling us, you know, you make a pretty good wine. Mm -hmm. this, is, this, is, uh, this is something you might want to consider. This was in that 10-year process of me tiring of corporate America. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't until probably seven, eight years in that we thought, 
you know what, this, this could possibly be a next career for us. Mm -hmm. we, could, we could phase into this. Uh, we just, we loved everything about it and everyone we knew who was making wine and who owned a winery, they were nice people, seemed to be making a decent living and, and loved what they did every day. Like, well, that's a pretty good next step. And so every year we would, we would visit Oregon because um, I'm from here, had fan, uh, relatives and, and friends up here and I graduated Oregon State, a lot of school friends. And every year we would come visit to Oregon. And, and every time we visited, we would go out wine tasting. And we were struck by how, how one dimensional the tasting experience was here. That everywhere we went, it was maybe one or two whites and three pinots on the tasting menu. And, and we enjoy all of those wines, but, but there was a, a lack of variety for us. After that, we still wanted a big red. Mm -hmm. And we, we just didn't find a lot of big reds here. A few Washington wineries that have, have wine over here. But we felt that if we're going to open a winery, we can either do it in Lodi and be like everybody else, or we can do it in Oregon and be pretty, pretty unique. And so I, I, I met with the OLCC and said, here's what we'd, we're thinking about doing. First, is it legal? Uh, then, then is it possible or difficult, uh, and, and, they, and they, were, they were great. Mm -hmm. They said, yeah, it's, it's very legal. You'll just pay an import tax when you bring your wine into the state, mm -hmm. but everything you want to do is, is very legal. Mm -hmm. uh, he goes, I'm not going to tell you how, how smart I think it is or if that's a, a good business niche or not. That's entirely up to you. you know, seems a little risky to me, but, uh, and that's part of how we got to the name Bravero. Bravero means doing something risky or daring and doing it very well. And we thought that going into the heart of Oregon Pinot Noir country with a lineup of big, bold, out-of-state reds mm -hmm. was a little risky. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were it's all, exactly five years ago right now, we were setting up our tasting room. We opened on June, or July 16th of 2016. And, and it, it's, it's been a wonderful five years. Mm -hmm. it, uh, the, the risk, uh, the, 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 the scary part about it is gone. Now we're just building a wonderful business. Mm -hmm. You mentioned enjoying the process as you were kind of learning as uh, learning on the way. Tell me about learning to make wine, learning to source grapes, learning to source materials, all those things. What did you enjoy about the process and, and how did you sort of improve your winemaking over time? Being a, a business executive, I, I looked at the, the business model differently than I think most wineries do. Almost everybody we met was a winemaker who started the business, who really didn't understand the business concept, when I would ask someone, what does it cost you to make that wine? They would look at me blankly like, I don't know, how would I figure that out? Which is where I started. Mm -hmm. And so my mind was, was always on the business side of it, not the, I'd take the passion out of it, take the emotion out of it, and, and work the, the business angles. And, and so what I found in, in my business world was that the business executives always hired the technicians. Technicians rarely ran a company. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, that would seem a better angle to go at this, and I had the business expertise, and so we hired the winemakers. Mm -hmm. And, and it uh, was kind of a reverse angle, but technicians can, can be replaced. Um, if you're not getting along with the winemaker, or you don't like the, pr the product they're making, it was like any other business that I had been in, you replace the technician. Mm -hmm. But they don't run the business. You mentioned th talking to the OLCC. Tell me the original concept as you described it to them. What was the original concept you were thinking of and, and what, what, what were the riskiest parts in your mind as you were setting it up? Well, my business plan is about that thick. And <laughs> so I walked in with my business plan and put it down on a table and said, here's, here's what we want to do. And the short version of that is we want to continue to make wine in California, uh, bring it to Oregon, and sell it in a tasting room here. Can we do that? Mm -hmm. Uh, sure, you can do that. Um, so there weren't a lot of weren't a lot of uh, legal hurdles to get over with the OLCC. I was expecting maybe a little more mm -hmm. uh, pushback, but he just said you're going to be taxed twice. You're going to you're going to pay the tax the federal tax when you, wherever you make that California, and then you're going to pay a state tax here. Nobody else has to do that. If you make your wine here, you don't pay an import tax, obviously. So it's going to be an additional expense for you that other wineries here don't have. But but that's your call. Mm -hmm. So the Department of Agriculture, um, the OLCC, and the county, Yamhill County, uh, we had to file with all, the city of Newburgh and had to file all, and, and all along the way it was just a procedural stuff. It was fill out the forms, pay the fees, next step. 
Tell me about finding a winemaker. What were you, what were you looking for and, and how did you go about the process of finding a winemaker? Well, we knew several. So oh, during those 10 years, we not only worked with the one winery that we did work with then and still work with now, um, but, but we got to know several other winemakers because that first winemaker introduced us to them. Mm -hmm. So we ended up meeting grape growers and winemakers. Some of those are the same people. Some people grow grapes and make wine. Some people just do one or the other. And so we met several different winemakers and, and we, we reversed uh, engineered our wines. So we would start with, let's just let's start with Zinfandel. We would start with, what's our favorite Zinfandel in Lodi? And we would make a short list of our favorite Zinfandels. Uh, then we would find out who made the wine and where did they get the grapes? Mm -hmm. And that's all, everyone was happy to share with us. Oh yeah, here, here's the guy that I buy it from. Can I get his phone number? And, or can I piggyback with your order? When you order yours in, can I order you know, an extra couple of ton on top of your order? And, and all we have are handshake deals with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, they're friends. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're not going to uh, hurt us. We're not, we're gonna, it's just a, a good friendship that we, we buy the grapes, we get them to the winemaker, they make the wine, we bring it up here. Mm -hmm. We're in the process all along the way. We go down quarterly to Lodi to meet with the winemaker. While we're speaking right now, one of my winemakers is in our guest suite here staying with us. We go back and forth. Uh, we send samples back and forth. And then when it comes time for the final product, if, if there's a blend to be done, we're very involved in the blending of, any, of all of our wines. What's the, what we, how would you describe this to obviously big bold reds, California, California reds. Tell me about beyond that, what's the style you're going for? What, what, what's the customer experience supposed to be when they drink one of your wines? Um, we're, we're looking for a, my wife and I make wine that, that we like. We hope you like it. If you don't, that's, that's okay because we can't make wine for other people and I don't believe in trying to be all things to all people. We've, we've found, people ask me, why don't you make a white? Why don't you do a Pinot? Why don't you do a Rosé? Why don't you do a Sparkling? Because I'd rather do one thing and do it very well. And so we're, we're not trying to give you the full tasting experience. We're trying to pick that one niche and do it extremely well. The, typically our wines are full bodied, uh, bigger tannins, but we have expanded that to, to like a, a Barbera with a lower, with a higher acid, mm -hmm. more like a Pinot that has a higher acid. I personally don't prefer wines with high acid, so a Grenache like that, I just, just not my favorite. Um, so we, we stay with the wines that we like. Occasionally we'll, we'll branch out, my wife and I both have veto power, so if she wants to make something that I don't, I can say, nope, just not into that because I gotta sell it. I got, I got to have the passion behind it. And if you said, let's make a Grenache this year, I would say absolutely not. Maybe someday, not now. Mm -hmm. So what we found though, is that the people who, who taste in our tasting rooms like what we're doing. And so when, when they heard that we bought this property that has Pinot and Chardonnay on the property, to some of them, it was, it was a bit of a disappointment. Like, oh no, 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 you don't, don't dilute the brand. You know, we come here because you're big, bold reds. We can get Pinot anywhere. And, and so the, the county is requiring us to make wine from the grapes on the property here. Mm -hmm. To get the license for the tasting room, we have to do that. So we agreed, it's, it's not a big deal, we'll make a Pinot, but it's not going to be a typical Oregon Pinot. My winemaker told me last week, Steve, you have a wonderful Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. I know that's not what you want. <laughs> so, so we're gonna leave it in the barrel for 18 months which is not typical at all here. Typically it's 11 months because people want the barrels for the next harvest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To me, that shouldn't be the driving force between, behind when you bottle the wine. So we've got brand new French oak barrels. We're going to leave it in the barrels for 18 months. Then we're gonna blend in 10% Syrah, the legal maximum to still call it a Pinot Noir. Uh, it isn't going to taste like a Pinot Noir. It's, gonna, it's going to be a big, bold Pinot um, because that's something I would drink. <laughs> So you mentioned five, about five years ago you were getting the, the, the first, so you have two tasting rooms. Tell me about the, the, the first spot and, and f finding the space and getting it set up to be the, your first tasting room. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of inventory at the time. And so when we moved up here, we didn't have a location, which was a, for, a pretty risky thing in itself. We hadn't lived here for 33 years, so I didn't know the area real well, except I knew where wine country was. So we, we knew that the bulk of the, of, we thought the bulk of our customers would be in the Portland metro area. So we wanted to be close enough to the metro area, uh, but not in it. So we looked starting at Sherwood. 
and, and that still felt a little too metro for us. So the next town out was Newburgh. We didn't start there. We, we looked at Newburgh and McMinnville and Carleton uh, and Dundee. In fact, we had three different leases with my pen to the lease ready to sign. And last minute I said, I'm not feeling it. Something doesn't feel right here. And, and we didn't do it. And when the Newburgh space became available, um, we jumped on that. And, and, and I think five years later, I would say, wow, what a, what a find. It has been great for us. It's not a big space. It's, it, it's, it's, we're all about the wine, not, uh, not, not the, the location. So we, we love being in Newburgh. And, and the plan was to be, for, for about a five-year plan, the five-year mark we had hoped that we could find or, or find, either find property or find a vineyard. It's hard to find a vineyard. But find property that we could build a tasting room and, and either move the, the operation or add to it. Mm. And about the four-year mark, um, some people retired who owned a small small winery and a small vineyard, and and we were the only people interested in this property, because with a with a vineyard with 400 olive trees with a tasting room, that only fits a certain small niche of people who would want it. But we, it was perfect for us. So with this space, then what has that enabled you to do, and 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 how what are the pro, what are the plans for this space going forward? Well, the initial plan was that it has a tasting room. It's a small tasting room already, and we were going to use that, but that's when COVID hit. We moved in in February of 2020. So by March, <laughs> that plan kind of went by the wayside because we couldn't taste indoors. So the tasting room that we had planned to open couldn't open, but we could do outdoor tasting. So where you are right now is in our backyard, but the space turned into a very open, available tasting space. So we still have plans to, to expand our indoor tasting room, mm -hmm. and we're still doing a lot of construction here now, but, but this, it's opened up a different market for us because the Newburgh market is still more Portland Metro people, and our wine club members from that area will come out here and see us. It's only 16 miles, another 23 minutes from Newburgh, but you're more than an hour from, from downtown Portland. Mm -hmm. Those people, because they know us in every relationship, will come out here. But it's opened up a new market because people in Salem typically come out here to the Eola Amity Hills AVA to taste. And so most of our new customers are south of here mm -hmm. or, or the McMinnville. Mm -hmm. But McMinnville, Salem, Silverton, we get a lot of Corvallis, Albany, a lot of those people that didn't go to Newburgh. Mm -hmm. So it's really become two markets for us. You mentioned the reaction to your kind of different style of, of wine here in the valley. Tell me about uh, finding a customer base, selling your wine, getting your name out there. What have been the biggest kind of positive parts for you? And, and what are the, do you still have people who come in here and are shocked that you don't offer a lot of different Pinot Noirs? We were committed to uh, growing organically. Uh, so it wasn't going to be a, an advertising based model. It's, it's gonna be a word of mouth model. Mm -hmm. And that was a little scary also because it's maybe less expensive up front, but you, you rely on people liking the product and the experience to pull that off. And, and we have stuck with that for five years and, and will. We do very little advertising. And the best advertising we've, we've done were these couple little uh, sandwich board A-frames that we put in downtown Newburgh. And we, we, we shout big bold reds and whisper reverse hours because they don't care about that. The big bold reds, and I can't tell you how many people say, I was driving through downtown Newburgh and I saw that A-frame and I pulled in. You speak in my language. And typically, we, we found that people who like big bold reds have friends who like big bold reds. And so they bring their, their friends and it's, been, uh, it's all been a referral-based growth. Were you surprised at all by the kind of demand for big bold reds in Oregon? A little surprised. We, we have found two customers. One is one wants variety. They like Pinot, but, uh, but they want something bolder with that. And, and, and I would put myself in that category. I like Pinot a lot, but I also like something else. There are other people here who just don't like Pinot. And, and those people find us too. Um, I, I would never say a bad word about Pinot. I'm not that guy who doesn't like Pinot. I like Pinot. Um, Glad we're around Pinot. There's some wonderful Pinots here. But, but the variety, most of our customers just like variety. You talked earlier about kind of your sort of unique approach coming with a business background rather than a winemaking background. Uh, 
according to that initial business plan, how are things going uh, five years in? Are, are this is about what you expected to be? Uh, have there been big kind of drastic differences between your expectations and reality? Uh, um, one was the bypass. We weren't really aware that the bypass was a, a done deal when we moved in five years ago. Uh, I don't know if I didn't do that research or just didn't hear about it, but, but missed that. And so when we opened in downtown Newburgh, it was before the bypass. Um, you know, six, eight, nine months later, the bypass opened up, and I was uh, in awe at the lack of traffic. It, like the traffic counts through downtown Newburgh were cut in half. Mm -hmm. So to go from 39,000 cars a day, seeing our signs to see half that number, was like, what happened here? How did we miss that? Why did we come to Newburgh? This is killing us. And we heard from a lot of other businesses in town that relied on drive-by traffic mm -hmm. um, that they were just hit by it hard. I think a lot of that has, has recovered now where the people who, have, who do take the bypass weren't gonna stop anyway, or I'm hoping that, um, because, because our numbers have recovered a lot. And with, with, you mentioned kind of as part of the plan was this, the second site, was finding something like this. Um, were there other places you looked at? Uh, was this the first site you kind of looked at seriously and for the kind of the vineyard site? One, one prior that we didn't get, and, and I was so disappointed, it was, it was up on uh, Rex Hill, behind Rex Hill Winery. And if we had opened that one, we would have closed the downtown Newburgh, because they're both in Newburgh a couple miles away. Mm -hmm. And, and there was a house and a space for a tasting room, or a barn that we would have converted to a tasting room. There was a small vineyard that we would have expanded. And I was very excited about that property. And the day that I was writing the check for that, um, the realtor gave it to somebody else for a few thousand dollars more than us. I was livid, our realtor was livid, but there wasn't anything we could do about it. And, and so I was hurt for a while mm -hmm. until this came along. <laughs> And when this came along, that was so much better, and it, it helped that a lot. But there just weren't a lot of properties around. That we, this is ready for a tasting room. It's ready for a, it's already got a, a vineyard going. Um, that was one, but then we just kept looking, looking. We, we looked at a lot of properties, like we're never gonna find a place with a vineyard that's ready to go. And starting over would have been, yeah, you plant the vineyard and it's four, three, four years before you ever get any grapes out of it, and to build a tasting room. It would have been a long project. Mm -hmm. Um, where this was ready to go. Tasting room, open, ready to go. Vineyard already here, already producing, a 15-year-old vineyard at the time. Is there anything different that you've discovered about selling wine versus selling other things? Is it, is it, is it a commodity like anything else or is there a different style you or approach you take to selling it? We don't, I don't think we sell just wine. What we try to do is sell an experience. And if you can create a memorable experience, I, so I understand that when people take our, when they purchase our product, they're taking it with them. When they take it home, I hear oftentimes that, gosh, the wine tasted so much better at the winery than it tastes at home. I never hear that. And, and that's why we don't want a fancy place either. We, we, a lot of times we hear from people that, gosh, this place is gorgeous, but the wine's not very good. I'll go there for the scenery, I'll go there for the view, I'll go there because it's really nice, but the wine's so-so. I would much rather have people say, uh, the place isn't anything exciting, but the wine was really good and I had a really good experience there. And so when I look back through all of our reviews on, on Yelp and Google and Facebook, and, and we have five-star reviews, not just some, but our, our average rating is five stars. Um, it's, it's what we're doing is working. People really like the wine. They're having a good experience and they don't really seem to care that the place isn't fancy. When it comes to experience beyond the wine, what is it you're hoping people, what are you trying to give people in terms of experience? Um, people like information. We're, because we're so different uh, and, and we let each customer drive the conversation. So I don't have like a, a script that some, you know, 10 different people come in and, and I'm, they're going to get the same pitch every time. 10 different people will have 10 different conversations because they drive the conversation, not us. So I ask questions to get the tasters talking. I want to learn about them and their likes, whether it's about wine or something else, but I'd rather shout you and whisper me. 
So this is even awkward for me that you're asking a short question. I'm giving a long answer because I don't, I don't, that's not my typical repartee. So you talked about having, a, having plans to open a tasting room last year and having COVID get impacted. I'm curious, um, COVID hits in, in spring of 2020. Aside, aside from that, kind of foiling your plans to open this tasting room, tell me about the other kind of immediate personal professional reaction to the pandemic. Uh, and what adjustments did you have to make last year that maybe you weren't expecting to have to make? Yeah, you know, when, I, when I looked through that business plan that was that thick, there was no mention of a pandemic in there. <laughs> so I guess another one going to miss there. I don't know how I could have ever foreseen that, but uh, didn't. So when, when it first hit, it was, I don't know how long this is going to last. You know, is this just something we can, is this an, a, a speed bump that's going to be over shortly? Hmm. Or is this a longer term thing? I didn't know. Nobody knew. Hmm. So, so in March, when we had to stop tasting wine, um, and, and this second space wasn't even available yet, it, it put even more um, reliance on our wine club because we had no new, new customers. No one could come in and taste. So I stayed open, I think it was four days a week at the time, so that our wine club members could still come down and pick up wine that they had already purchased as part of a wine club shipment or come in and just buy bottles of wine. So, so it, it lowered our labor. So I didn't, it lowered our tasting because I couldn't. And act, actually our sales increased. Mm -hmm because wine club members, which was now our only business, or people who'd stop in just to buy bottles, mm -hmm. but that went up because as you probably know, most people drank more during the pandemic than they did before. So it was an increase in business, uh, increase in sales with a decrease in our expenses. So overall, it was a profitable time for us, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. But it was, it was nine months into that pandemic before we opened up this location. So where we're sitting now is an outdoor space, and we were open this on January 1st, and, and it was cold. We had the fireplace going, I've got heaters in the ceiling they were on, and people would wrap up and sit out here in, in the cold of winter and enjoy big red wines. So that's when we started having two tasting rooms. <laughs> but we couldn't taste in Newburgh because it was all indoors. So if you wanted to taste, come to Amity. If you don't mind it, Newburgh's open, you can go there. Were there, were there changes you saw in the industry at, at large during the pandemic? Are the things that happened in the last year and a half that uh, you see sticking around for, for good? Uh, or is the industry going to revert back to basically what it was before the pandemic as we start to come out of it? We never took reservations. Um, I just don't like the idea of going tasting on a time schedule. Uh, I've heard from so many of the people who come here that they don't either but they've had to at most places. Places would require a credit card up front. If you don't show up on time or show up at all, they're gonna charge your credit card. Don't like that. So again, back to that experience, we're trying to create something that is all positive. How can you make it all positive? Well, you, you get rid of restrictions. So no reservation, no credit card up front. Come when you want, go when you want, stay as long as you want, uh, bring food if you want. It was a kind of an open-ended, you're in charge here, not me. I'm providing the wine, you're in charge of everything else. And people like that. They, they come here and tell me, I'm here, and they, they come in frustrated. You know, I, I came from here because some of the place we were at, we walked in, the place was half empty. We didn't have a reservation, they wouldn't let us in. Mm -hmm. So we looked to see who's open, who doesn't take a reservation, and, and they come here. So we haven't changed anything since it started. No reservations. Never will. You told us earlier about the kind of the growth in terms of production. Tell me about um, as you've grown, uh, how have you decided when to add more quantity or, or different styles or excuse me, different varietals? Um, and, and do you have a size in mind? Is there, is there a goal in mind of how, how much production per year? We're there. You're there. <laughs> <laughs> We're there after five years. We started producing a thousand cases. And, and the plan, the business plan, was to grow to 2,500 case production and, and level off there. We do no distribution. We're in no restaurants, no stores, never will. We are all direct to consumer. We sell through our two tasting rooms, to our wine club, on our website, that's it. Um, this, this next year we're producing 2,600 cases. That's what we have in the barrel right now. Um, so I'm going a little bit over, but I'm staying right around that 2,500 mark, we're not gonna expand beyond there. Mm -hmm. 
and it's a, it's a good size for us to manage. Um, it's, a, it's a good size for, for, for the size operation. And I initially, the, the, the plan was for us to grow as big as we could be, get with my wife and me running this. That's it. Well, we've already brought on two employees. So I'm, I'm, but I don't want to hire any more. Like I don't need more because we have two locations, and we just can't cover seven days in, in both locations. So, what about when it comes to varietals? Uh, do you do you want to make as uh, do you want to make the same ones year after year? Do you want to mix and match? What, what's kind of the plan there? This has been a great experience for us to 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 learn what people like because coming into Oregon not knowing. Okay, we think they're going to like big reds. We hope they like big reds. Which ones? Um, and so we started no more than 100 cases of any wine. So four barrels. So we're making four barrels of Zinfandel, and then we'll see how it sells. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of done two things. One is we limited the production so we'd never have too much of anything that people didn't like here. And the other one was we, we price every wine the same price. So every bottle of wine is $40 retail, 32 for our wine club. And, and people were struck by that. When they look at the tasting menu, they say, I've never seen this before. Why, why are you doing this? I said, because I need to know what people like, not what they like based on the price. And so when a wine sells for $5 more or $5 less, it affects your taste buds. We've taken that out of the equation. So now, now you're tasting, and it's like, oh no, now you're feeling more pressure to, do I really like this or not? Mm -hmm. And people tell us what they like by what they buy. Mm -hmm. So we, we started looking at the sales of, not everything we've made has sold out. We've sold through every single wine. Now it's just a matter of how fast do we sell through it. And so the three wines that we consistently sell through regularly are our, our old vine or ancient vine, Zinfandel, our Tempranillo, and our Petit Syrah. Those three will, will be in our lineup most of the time. And, and if we run out of one and we don't have the next vintage ready to go, people are disappointed. Oh no, I came for the Zinfandel. When's the next one gonna be in? Mm -hmm. So we try to keep those three, and we're up to 250 cases production, 10 barrels of each of those. Then we cycle through different ones to see, are they going to like this or not? I didn't want to do a Barbera. My wife wanted a Barbera. I said, okay, okay, all right, let's try a Barbera. So we did a, 150 cases of Barbera to see, and it's doing very well. Uh, we do some red blends. Every year we do a, a Bordeaux blend we call the Matador. The logo on our bottle is an abstract painting of a Matador's cape in motion. And can I tell you about the logo, the, the, the label? Remind me to come back to the varietals. <laughs> so the label, when, when we uh, first got up here and we're still starting the business, I went to the, um, I know Ed Ray, who was the president of Oregon State University, met with, with Ed and said, here's what, we're, here's what we're doing. We came back to Oregon, opened this winery. I'd like to talk to the business department about helping us come up with a, a, a bottle design. And Ed put me in touch with the dean of the business school. I met with her. She looked at my business plan and said, now you know that's not gonna happen, right? I said, well, I, I, within reason, I hope a lot of it happens, but she was, just so you know, you know, there's things happen along the way, and how can we help? And I said, I'd, I would like to, to uh, use your students to do a, a, a bottle design. Great. She put me in touch with the design department that had just come into the business department, and 20 students um, agreed to submit samples of art. I told them, you're not going to get paid. This is a learning, uh, real-life learning project for you. you, you know, and." And so 20 students submitted, some of them submitted two or three labels. We didn't like any of them. So I went back and said, well, here's, here's a kind of a dose of reality. We didn't like what you did. None of it, none of it. So let's try this again, but now we're up against the clock. Now I got like 60 days before, I've got to have a design to get labels ready to put on our bottles because we're opening in July. And some kids stayed in the program, did more, some left, some new ones came in. And there, were, there was one that just my wife and I just hands down said, that's, that's it. And so I went back and held up the artwork and said, this is the winner. And it was a freshman, a freshman who had designed that. And, uh, and he said, five years later now, we, we've still done some work with him on other projects. And he said that uh, the better we do, the better, the better it is for him with his projects. And so, but one, the design he made was a, a, an abstract painting of a matador's cape in motion. And the different shades of red symbolize our different red wines. It looks very fluid, it could be a wine spill, but people, uh, people like that. And so we, we make a Bordeaux blend every year that we call the Matador, mm -hmm. El Matador. And I did that in Spanish because my wife's from Mexico, born and raised, and so we pay tribute to that, her upbringing. 
And the Matadors of Bordeaux blend we make every year, but we change the blend every year. So you can never do a vertical of it because no two are alike. And uh, the Matador, so we, we have a Bordeaux blend, that, but it cycles through, because we might only do 150, 200 cases of that. But we've tried several varietals. The Petit Bordeaux does very well here. We don't do it in huge quantities because it's similar to a Petit Syrah. But we, we, uh, we do an Alicante Boucher that most people have never heard of. Uh, but when they have it, they love it. We do a Tanat that is just off the chart good. We initially uh, did not want to submit any of our wines to judging because mm -hmm. I really don't care what anybody thinks of my wine except the person across the tasting bar. The only taste buds that matter. But if you enter the festivals, which we weren't going to do, you have to submit uh, wines for judging. So when we decided to, uh, to do a few of the wine festivals and we submitted them and got some great medals, it was like, well, gosh, this actually does help us sell the wine. Hang that medal on the wine, tell people you got a double gold medal for that Petit Syrah, and, and it sets the stage for, I hope I like it, uh, which they do. So I think we do like 12 different varietals that we've done, and uh, we, we just we cycle through. Some year we buy the grapes, some, some, sometimes we don't. Mm -hmm. Are there things out there that you haven't made yet that you're looking forward to trying to make? No. In five years, we've pretty much made all the varietals that I want to make. Um, we've increased quantities of some. The Tanat, I just can't get enough of the grape. It's, it's been a wonderful wine for us. Uh, last year, we ran into a problem in Lodi because Napa had all kinds of smoke damage. And so they didn't have a lot of grapes. And so a lot of the Napa winemakers came over to Lodi and bought more grapes. So if they're buying the fruit, I had a couple, a couple grape growers call me and say, Steve, um, these guys are waving a lot of money at me. You know, can you take a pass on, on this grape this year and I promise I'll make it up to you next year? Um, but they're waving a lot of money. I said, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So our 2020 varietals are a little different. With a, with a, with a lot of different varietals people may have not heard of before or maybe have never tasted before, what do you feel your role is in, in educating them? And what do you, how do you try to educate them? How much do you want them to know before they taste it? And, and how much do you want them to know like, throughout the experience of mm -hmm. tasting? Again, we let the customer drive that conversation. And so if, if we're tasting a Tanat and people go, what is that? How do you pronounce it? I've never heard of the grape before. We pull out our copy of Wine Folly and we pop that open on the, on the wine tasting bar and turn to Tanat and show them a little bit about the grape. So the, the education part is only if they want it. I'm not going to try to educate you on Tanat uh, if you don't care or if you've had it several times and you know all about it. But if you're interested, uh, but things like Tanat, the, the Cinso, the Carignan, the Alicante Boucher, people just never heard of most of those up here. And so we've, we've worn out copies of the book. The binders are just falling apart because we keep opening these pages and go, here it is. This is, this is what Alicante Boucher is. Mm -hmm. And, and in, a, in a few 30 seconds, they've picked up a, enough. Oh, okay, I get it. Yeah, big tannin, big body. Uh, yeah, I get it. Low acid. Ah, okay. Have you seen since you since you got into the into the Oregon wine scene? Have you seen things change in terms of? Um, you mentioned a very one-dimensional experience when you were coming up here tasting and before. Has that changed at all? Do you see other places doing something more similar to what you're doing now? We we see a few Washington wineries that have come over. There were already some that were here. Now there's a few more. Uh, in fact, we, we embrace that. And so what we do is a, a we call it a big red wine tour twice a year. Couldn't do it the last year and a half because of the pandemic, but we're starting up again in October. And, and I get nine other wineries that have at least three big reds. So we know who's making wine like us. They're all Washington, maybe a couple of Southern Oregon ones, but we do a red tour, big red tour where, where we send out a notice to all of our wine club members and the other nine wineries do the same thing. And during the month of October, we share all of our wine club. So all of those wine club members can go to any of those 10 wineries and taste complimentary. Anything they buy is at wine club price. And it has been a win, win, win. Mm -hmm. it, it's a win for all of the wineries. It's a win for the customer. It's just, it's a win all the way around because if you like big red wine, I don't expect you, it's the only business I know where you help your competition. I don't even think it was competition. Uh, people who b belong to our wine club, typically belong to a couple other wine clubs that also do big reds. And we don't expect them to only drink our wine. I don't only drink our wine, why should they? 
And big red wine people have a, it's kind of a common bond among us mm -hmm. that we all help each other. We, we send customers to each other. I think twice in five years, someone has asked me, where can I go get a, big, a, a good Pinot? Either they know or they can easily figure it out because it's everywhere and it's wonderful. There's great Pinots here. What they do ask me is, where can I go get another big Cabernet? Mm -hmm. Where can I go get, get another Bordeaux blend? And so we're happy to, to send people to the other wineries that make wine like us. Mm -hmm. So you brought up an interesting point about last year and then the smoke damage in Napa and obviously some more, some more episodes here in the Willamette Valley. Uh, I'm curious as you look ahead, um, is grape sourcing going to be increasingly difficult for you? Are you, are you? What are you anticipating in terms of getting grapes out of California and potentially out of Oregon eventually if, if that's what you want to do? Is that going to be more difficult? Are you, do you have sort of plans in, in, in mind for how you're going to handle if the smoke continues at the way, rate it is? Loda, Loda has been very, uh, all, I guess, lucky with all the fires in California because several different wine regions in California have been uh, hurt bad by fires. Lodi hasn't at all. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll be down in Lodi when, when there's a fire raging in, San, in, in, in Napa or some, Sonoma. And you can see smoke high in the sky blowing over, but it's not affecting Lodi, and there's been no fires in Lodi. Also, the Lodi fruit is so consistent year after year because the weather's pretty consistent. From May to September, the growing season for the grapes, it's between 90 and 105 every day and no chance of rain. And it pretty much stays the same year after year. So the quality of the fruit stays pretty consistent year after year. But we haven't seen any, any fluctuation. I mean, the prices haven't really fluctuated much. Mm -hmm. So the availability of grapes has, has been there. Um, price is consistent. Our relationships with the grape growers is, is, is still good. Mm -hmm. And 90% of our fruit comes from Lodi. Mm -hmm. we, we get some fruit approximately 10% out of, out of Washington, uh, either Walla Walla, Yakima, Red Mountain. And we buy most of our Bordeaux fruit out of, out of Washington. And then the little bit of Pinot and Chardonnay that we have here. So I know you haven't been in the organ industry too long, but are there any, any changes you've seen kind of at industry, well, industry level that have, have taken place since you've been here? And, and as you look ahead, especially coming out of the pandemic, what does the industry going to look like in the coming five or 10 years? Um, the, 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 the global warming topic comes up frequently because people say, you know, you're gonna start getting, growing Cabernet up here. I don't think that's gonna happen in my lifetime. Um, it, it, yes, it's obviously warmer here than it has been, which has been great for, for our fruit, but I don't, I don't see you know, Napa not growing Cabernet in my lifetime, I don't see Oregon being coming a Cabernet capital. You know, again, maybe maybe a generation from now, but not. It's not going to happen overnight. It's not mm -hmm. going to happen anytime soon. We would love to be able to graft over our Pinot to to Tempranillo or Zinfandel or Petit Syrah. It wouldn't grow here. Uh, it need, they need long hot summers, and it's just it's not here. So as you look ahead for the industry then, are there other changes outside of climate uh, that you see coming or that things you're excited for in the future, things you're, look, uh, things you're a little bit fearful of in the future? Uh, no, I don't, I don't see uh, drastic changes in, there there's continues to be more, uh, more wineries growing up, building here, moving into the area. Doesn't seem like it's reached a saturation point yet. I'm not seeing a lot of fallout at least not, not in, in our niche. Uh, if, there, if there's a glut of Pinot, you know, I don't, I don't follow that. Mm -hmm. I don't know that. But for us, I, I see a few more Washington wineries coming in that do big reds like us. We're the only one that's doing, you know, a full lineup of California wines. You know, I haven't figured out why someone else isn't doing that, but, <laughs> but, but I hope they don't anytime soon. Uh, if they do, we'll embrace them because we'll, we'll have something in common. So what about for the future for yourself? You mentioned you've, you've reached the size you want to be. Uh, future plans for um, expansion or projects, or, or is it just kind of status quo for, for, for a while? Yeah, we're trying to make the, the wine tasting experience here better. That's why we have one construction project going on right now. We have two slated for next spring, and then I think we're done. Uh, we're just trying to, we're trying to, by helping the experience, we're trying to put people in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the two projects we're doing are to make seating areas 
in or next to the vineyards, close as we can get them. People like to see the grapes. They want to feel the vineyard. They want to be part of that experience. And so if we can do that without, without sticking a chair in the middle of a couple rows, we're getting to people like 15 feet away. You're going to be sitting there tasting wine 15, away, 15 feet away from the vines. That's pretty cool. With a view of Mount Hood uh, behind you, like, okay, that, that's, a, that's okay. That's a nice experience. So all we're doing is, is improving the experience uh, the, the people that we have representing us, I'm, I'm very, very picky about who we have represent us. Uh, they can't talk nearly as much as I'm talking here. It's, it's listen, listen, listen. Direct the conversation, keep the people talking, uh, and keep them talking about wine and about uh, the wine experience. Mm -hmm. we're, we're taking a, a group of wine club members to Bordeaux, France, year after next. Um, it took us three weeks to practically fill up the ship. That was it. They're, uh, they like this kind of wine. They're uh, avid travelers. They have disposable income. Hmm. All right, that's all the questions that I have for you. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover here today that we should have covered? Covered the bottles, covered the pricing, <laughs> covered, the, uh, covered the grapes, covered, what did we miss? <laughs> I don't know. All right. Can't think of anything else. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today, for, for sharing your story with us, sharing your amazing space with us, and uh, we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. Thanks.